So, um, what I promised to deliver is talk about consciousness, phenomenology, cognitive science, and Buddhism. So, I started by talking about phenomenology and cognitive science, and last time I started to introduce some Buddhist ideas, and today I will continue by talking about the actions, karma, and self. So today are quintessential Buddhist topics. In a way, our central topic, consciousness, is done. And now we're talking about relevant topics, but consciousness, we have done it in a way. So what I'm going to do first is summarize what we have done, and then after that, talk about actions, agency, and selfhood. Okay? So, what we have done is talk about description of consciousness, right? Now, I emphasize the word description, and I oppose this word description to explanation. We have not provided an explanation of consciousness, but we have tried to provide a description of consciousness. And that description is well, from what I have called the first-person perspective, which is the perspective of one's own experience. And so what we have tried to do is combine Western phenomenology and Buddhist ideas about consciousness to try to draw a description of what consciousness looks like from the first-person perspective. And the good news is that there is a relative uh, kind of uh, coming together there is a relative large overlap between Western descriptions and Indian descriptions. And so that's a really good news. So we can uh, kind of develop a broad description of consciousness from the first-person perspective. The bad news, obviously, is that we should not take this to be an explanation of consciousness. That is, we should not think that the description that we are uh, giving has necessary metaphysical explanations. Whether it has metaphysical explanation or not, that's a separate question. Phenomenology is simply a descriptive discipline. That is, it describes features of our experience, it does not, if you want, go beyond the experience and explain how we have the experience, right? So we should never think that the kind of description that we have given, and that I am going to summarize uh, shortly, that this kind of description is a description of how consciousness is. It's a description of how consciousness appears to us, right? This is different. For example, we, we, well, if you were to ask me how, I would say my answer would be we don't know. Now, different people have different theories. My own take is that basically I never met a theory which really worked completely, so I think we're quite far away from uh, providing an explanation of consciousness. <laughs> and maybe we can never do that. This is what some philosophers argue, such as Husserl and other people. We call them mysterians. And then other people say, no, uh, we, we don't know whether we can or not, but we need to work at it scientifically and so on, right? So this is the explanation, this is 
that what these people are working towards is an explanation of consciousness. What we have done and what we can do from a meditative point of view uh, is a description, right, of consciousness, how it appears to us from the first person perspective. Okay? And that's what we have tried to do here. And then you will say, now some people want to deny that even that is possible. Daniel Dennett is one of them, and he argues no. What? Okay, he's a great guy. Uh, I, 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 like, I like Dennett personally, but I think his ideas, are, yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like them because I think we can do phenomenology. We can provide description of consciousness from the point of view of our experience. And I think it would be good if we have more description of meditative experience than we have so far. One of the interesting, I mean, you know, when, when I, I go to meetings, uh, or when I used to go to meetings like Mind and Life between scientists and, uh, and, and Buddhists, well, the Buddhists are supposed to be able to talk about experience, particularly meditative experience. But if you look actually at traditional text, uh, there is an, it's, you struggle to find description of experience. And yeah, that's a kind of, a, uh, I think that's a lack and would be good if we have more description of experience because I think we can give description of, ex, of, the exp, of our experience and that's the assumption that I have made in this course, that we can put our resources so-called Eastern and Western, Indian and uh, Western phenomenology, and when we put them together, we have interesting descriptions of experience of consciousness, which uh, we should hold on to, and which in the future can provide a uh, target for uh, scientifically-based explanation. This is why uh, the project of uh, the late Francesco Varela, in, uh, who created an approach called neurophenomenology, in which you try to combine phenomenological description of consciousness with uh, neuroscientific explanations. And that, I think, is an interesting way to go. Right now, it's still quite limited because it's really difficult to study the brain because it's very hard to get access to the brain. And so we have a very long way to go, but I think that provides an interesting way to try to find explanations of consciousness by holding to the features that we have uh, talked about uh, and trying to find uh, a, a kind of neuroscientific explanation for these features, right? So what we've talked about in terms of consciousness is we can basically understand it from the point of view of uh, going from the non-conscious to the fully conscious uh, cognitive event, right? We can think about this as a kind of a two or three steps process. So what this arrow represents is the, the input that comes from the senses, right? We are constantly bombarded by various input coming from various senses. That's when this input has started to be processed, that's what we call perceptual processing, right? perceptual processing. Now, <laughs> these inputs start at the pre-conscious level. There is a level of perceptual processing which is presumably completely 
unavailable to consciousness. And then there is the, if you want, the ultimate product when uh, one of these inputs uh, come to consciousness, right? And so what I have argued is that... So are you saying this is... The the thing, are you saying it's the thing attended or is this the consciousness? This is the cognitive event. Okay. That makes it clear. <laughs> Not this. Right, but yeah. I, I can't fit it in there. No, I know. Put an arrow. Yeah, this is a cognitive event, right? I have argued is that to make sense of consciousness, we think we need to think not just about the cognitive event, but also there is a kind of buffer zone, which we could call the background consciousness or phenomenal consciousness, in which these inputs are starting to rise to consciousness, but are not fully attended to, right? So what I have argued to is that in this model, there is more in consciousness than what we can attend it to. What we can attend it to, in a way, is here, right? Can I raise a concrete example? Yes, please. I put this uh, cushion here because the leg of the whiteboard is very easy to trip over. And George will trip over it, so will everybody, it's quite tricky. But if I put something there, he's much less likely to trip over it, even though he's not attending to it or not noticing it, yeah. he's still influencing his behavior. So this is something that's not attended to, but is still cognized somehow. Somehow. So is it inside the red circle or outside? Well, that's, that's why you see there is not a continuous line, right? Because uh, it's not entirely clear what the boundary is going to be between what's completely non-conscious. For example, uh, in the models we have of vision, which is, I think, the best model that w the senses that is best modeled so far, uh, it looks like at the earlier stage of perceptual processing, we have separate processing, for example, for shapes and colors. Now, I would think this is completely outside of any kind of conscious experience, right? And then as these uh, different uh, inputs start to be combined, they form objects, okay? So I think that's where the boundary is. But what is in consciousness and what is not in consciousness is not always completely clear. And I think it's okay, because if we think of consciousness as uh, well, remember, one of the interesting Buddhist ideas, this idea of uh, a background consciousness, the degree, what I've called the degree zero of subjectivity, right? Which is uh, in Yogacara, the Alaya Vijnana, in Theravada, the Bhavanga Chitta. They're not necessarily the same, but they have the same idea that there is a kind of degree zero of consciousness and that that degree zero gets kind of aroused into cognitive events, right? So, <coughs> oh, where's my, okay. Yeah, I, don't, I called it the basic consciousness. Right. In a way, you would think this is around here, right? The degree zero of subjectivity. It's like behind, right? Why does it have to be a dichotomy? I mean, well, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Okay, yeah, that's right. It's a way to categorize it, really. What's that? It's a way to categorize yeah. it. Yeah. You're categorizing it. But, so between the degree zero of subjectivity and this kind of uh, phenomenal consciousness, there is, it's a matter of degree, right? Because, for example, from deep sleep to dreams, 
to various state of consciousness, right? There is, there are differences, but it's not like one is conscious and the other is not conscious, right? So it's a matter of degree, right? And so uh, what is in, con in, in consciousness or what is not in consciousness is a difficult question. For example, you're looking for an object, right? You're looking for, oh, this is, this is my, oh, yeah. This is an object I love very much. My rosary, biggest discovery in my life. When I was a kid, I used to torture my hair. When I became a monk, they told me, you need a rosary, now I can torture a rosary, and my hair is still intact. <laughs> <laughs> 50 years later, not bad, not bad. Okay, so I love, this is from Japan, it's a great wood, I love this object. Or I lose it once in a while. Okay, I'm looking for the object, right? Now, <laughs> if you want to think about what is in my consciousness uh, when I'm looking for the object, clearly the desire to find the object is in my consciousness, right? But it's not here. What is here is looking at the empty table and looking under the bed and looking uh, at the, in the bathroom. That's what's here, right? The wish to find it is somewhere in consciousness, but it's not thematized as an object. It's not like I think, I, I, at first I think, yes, let's find the object, and then I keep this in my mind, and then I look for the object, right? Other example, uh, my foot is hurting, but it's not hurting that bad, right? So I go through my day more or less normally, but there is this kind of nagging sensation which is kind of in the back of my mind, and I know it's there, but it's not like this is what I think the whole day, right? It's, would think, somewhere around here. So when we think about consciousness, in a way we can think about the cognitive event, which would be like projected consciousness, and the kind of conscious background, which we could call the unprojected part of consciousness. And that whole thing is what I have called phenomenal consciousness, right? And that's why I have argued there is more in consciousness that, than what we can attend to. <laughs> the consequences of that kind of description is that all the objects that are given in consciousness outside of the degree zero, always I have the structure of a background and foreground. Degree zero doesn't have a structure of background and foreground, right? It's a pure space of receptivity. There is no foreground, there is no background, right? In deep sleep, there is no foreground, there is no background. This is why I call it the degree zero of subjectivity. As soon as you get out of this degree zero of subjectivity, consciousness takes the structure of a foreground and a background, right? So for example, in search for my rosary, uh, the object that I am encountering are in the foreground. In the background, the background is complicated because there is a visual background, but there is also in the background in my mind this wish to find the rosary, right? as well as a lot of sensations that I have about my body, right? For example, when I look for my rosary, I know where my body is, right? And yet I'm not focusing on my body, right? So I know I'm looking for it. I don't need to think where my body is. I know at every point where my body is, right? This is what we call proprioceptive awareness, right? 
So we realize that there is a lot more in consciousness than the actual cognitive events that occupy, uh, that I uh, apprehend more directly, right? There is a lot of stimuli that are arriving to consciousness, but are not fully thematized, which are not taken as objects. Now, this is what I have drawn this uh, discontinuous line, because the question is obviously what separates what's totally outside the realm of consciousness and what is uh, uh, n not outside, I guess inside, and that's a fair question. I guess one way to answer would be talking about what we can recall. I also talked about um, forced choice, right? Remember the example of uh, blind sight, right? Uh, I talked about blind sight and the fact, and one was wondering whether the person who is affected by blind sight whether uh, the visual objects, at least some of them, are in his consciousness, but he's not able to attend them to them, right? That's one example of, uh, that's, sorry, one possible explanation of uh, blind sight. Okay? So that's a description that we obtain when we kind of put our heads together and think about consciousness experience from the first person perspective, right? So what we have is we understand consciousness not just in terms of object apprehension, but as including a lot more uh, than the object directly apprehended because there is this kind of delicate transition that is happening between the senses and our awareness, right? And that transition in the model that I have followed in here, which is the model suggested by phenomenology, it's in a way a three-step model rather than a two-step model. It's not like unconscious conscious, it's like unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious, right? That's a model that I have tried to draw so far, right? Yes? How does the alpha, how does the alpha, beta, and delta stages enter into the picture? Okay. Uh, the short answer is I have no idea. The question, <laughs> the question is the, the people in brain science talk about alpha, beta, theta brain waves, right? Which is the rate at which the neurons are firing, right? And the answer is that I don't know because they don't know. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of speculation, and interesting speculation, about what these waves mean, right? There is also gamma waves. And for example, in some kind of meditation, you get a huge increase in gamma waves. Mexican waves? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and then uh, this is uh, the work of Richie Davidson in Wisconsin. When, when you ask him, what does that mean? And it's like, well... Not sure. Maybe it's about clarity, maybe it's about attention. Hard to know. Because this is, the, this is where we are at scientifically. That is, uh, it's really difficult to get to the brain, right? The brain is not like an arm or a leg or something you can dissect and know what it is, right? It's really hard to get to the brain. And so people need to try to find indirect way to get to the brain. So one of these ways is the EEG, which measures the rates at which the neuron are synchronizing. And I think that go is going to be very interesting because I think 
what we are going to get for an explanation is that, that basically consciousness or the pre-conscious, these are all ways in which various parts of the brain synchronize with each other. I think that's probably the direction we are going. But, you know, we have a long way to go to understand really what these different waves mean, right? And then we have the fMRI, which gives us areas which are activated in certain cognitive processes. But actually, this don't tell us very much, right? Because to know that about a million uh, neurons get activated somewhere around here, yeah, it tells you something, but it's not an explana a full explanation of consciousness, which is what I, what I said is that this is not an explanation of consciousness. It's a description of consciousness, or at least an attempt to give a description of consciousness from the first-person perspective. Yeah? Most of us grow up with this idea of the two, you know, in the basement is unconscious and above is conscious. Yeah. So there's, a, there's some where there's a distinction between being unconscious and conscious. In your model, where is unconsciousness? Okay. You said deep sleep, but are we conscious in deep sleep? Okay. Uh, the word unconscious can mean different things. Uh, often people, when they use the word unconscious, think about Freud, right? And Freud's unconscious is in a way different from this unconscious, right? Because Freud's unconscious is repressed memories, right? This is what the unconscious is for Freud first and foremost, right? Now, this is a bit a different way to think about the unconscious, though it's not completely different, but it is what, there is a lot of things that is happening cognitively that is unreachable by, from the point of view of our experience, right? Now, they, this could imp include repressed memories, but they include certainly a lot of uh, early perceptual processing, uh, the whole way in which consciousness kind of uh, makes us aware of our body. All this is outside of consciousness, at least of this kind of consciousness. Now, there are things which are completely unconscious, like most of the time our breathing is unconscious, right? Now, Interesting question, is it here or? Here. Yeah. Because of this, we, it's a bit hard to know, right? But there are certain, certain uh, cognitive processes which are certainly not part of our conscious experience. For example, the way in which our body adjusts itself, right? Usually we're not conscious of that. Uh, the early stages of vision, I think we're, in early, we're not conscious of that. So there is this transition between the non-conscious and the fully conscious. And I think it's a gradual transition. Yeah. While we're on brainwaves, uh, has something called the default default mode network? Possibly? Yes. Okay. Uh, people talk about the default network. Uh, apparently, the brain kind of is, oscillates between two states. One is a default network in which the brain is kind of more turned towards internal processes and, uh, and then turn outward. But people are still debating what this means. So we don't really know what the default network really is about and what it does exactly. One way to think about it is that it's turned towards the self, right? And then after it oscillates and turns toward the outside. But then, obviously, there is a problem, which is in our cognition, that's not what we do, right? 
we do the two together, right? Yeah. yeah. Subjectively, we do the two together. That's, in fact, what consciousness is, is about. That is, it's not just making these uh, inputs conscious, but it's also about uh, understanding how we are affected by these inputs, right? Well, well an, an example of that from what I read was the default mode network gets activated when people tell stories. So you're directed outward, but you're also... Yeah, that's... Okay. Uh, when you read this kind of stuff, you have to think of it as hypothesis. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Then this is the one hypothesis. Interesting, for example, in meditation, where does the default network intervene, right? Well, maybe day, daydreaming and is maybe connected to the default net network, maybe not. So yes, this is uh, one thing that people talk about a lot. Yes? Can we um, categorize uh, the pre-cognitive events into those that can be brought into consciousness by attending to them? And Sorry? So the three cognitive events. Yes. Some can be attended to. There's a category that can be attended to and brought into consciousness. And there's a category that can't be. So, for example, visual processing can't be brought into consciousness by attending, but me hearing my heartbeat can be. Involved. Yes. Right. Yes. There is this distinction, right? And there is also the question of what is being attended, what is in consciousness for any kind of experience, right? Now, I would think that most of the time, when you experience something, or let me turn to myself, when I experience something, I am not at all aware of my heartbeat, right? That's what I think. I could be wrong. So I think I would put the heartbeat here. So this is a description of consciousness that we have uh, come up with. So consciousness is this space of receptivity, of sense making, which is also uh, a characteristic of self-awareness. We're not just able to make sense of what is outside of us, but when we make sense of what is outside of us, we are at the same time aware of how we feel about it, right? And that's very important in Buddhism, Vedana, that's where our reaction to the outside stimuli starts, right? And consciousness is about has this uh, feature of self-awareness, and that self-awareness informs us of how we feel about what we experience, right? Now, that way of being informed is kind of a strange way, because it's not like we think about how we are affected. So we, when we perceive an object, that's an object, we perceive the object. At the same time that we perceive the object, we are informed about how we feel about it. But it's not like we think about our feelings and perception. They kind of color our experience of the world. But we know it immediately, right? In this kind of non-objectified way, it's immediately in our consciousness, right? And that's the double-sided uh, view of consciousness, which we find in phenomenologists like Husserl, Sartre, and so on. And we find it in Indian Buddhists like Dignaga, Dharmakirti, and many uh, Yogacharya, right? OK? Any question about consciousness? Because, in a way, that's the end of it. <laughs> We're done. We can go home.
<laughs> now we are going to talk about actions and self, right? Which are obvious topics to talk about, but they're not directly about consciousness. And next time we'll talk about emotions and meditation, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, this, this whole lecture has been very, uh, I can't say enlightening, but uh, very, <laughs> very uh, complex, and uh, I'm trying to make sense of it. Okay? Uh -huh. And what I know of consciousness is probably minuscule. But one thing that I, I did uh, uh, read was that people that study consciousness, um, say that it is so complex that uh, they don't even know uh, the right questions to ask. It's, it's beyond, almost beyond uh, understanding. Okay. It, it is beyond understanding. Okay, now I'm go can I answer? This is what we're doing here, yeah. asking the, question, the right questions. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're telling them, this is that the interesting features. Can we find explanations? Now, we have the easy job, right? Because we sit in our armchair, or we meditate, and we try to find descriptions of consciousness. But our description of consciousness is exactly that. They're the questions that we think are relevant to try to explain what consciousness is. But it is a tremendously complex uh, business, right? But this is exactly what this is kind of uh, stuff is trying to do, is trying to provide, if you want, descriptions so that people start to think about how can we explain these features of consciousness. Is he expressing the view of the mysterious? Well, in a way, yes, but... Uh, uh, is whether this is the view of the mis what I call the mysterians, right? Yes, in a way, yes, but uh, I, I think it's a simple honesty. Okay, this is a strong word because I'm going to imply that Dennett is not honest, which <laughs> I, I, I don't really want to say. But yeah, it is the honest assessment of where we are at whether we think that in the future we can explain consciousness or not. Honestly, we have to say this is really complicated and we are far from being there, right? This is like position of David Chalmers and most of the neuroscientists, this is what most of the neuroscientists, and then a guy like Dennett comes in, comes in and says, no, 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 you make it way too complicated. We don't need that kind of complication. You can get rid of all that. All what you need is this kind of sensory input and then thinking. So you have this, non, this perceptual processing which arrives to you non-consciously and then you think you have consciousness and you describe consciousness, but really <coughs> what you're doing is just making a theory because there is no such thing, or, or it's really doubtful there is such thing as a correct description of experience. But he defends phenomenology. No, he does not. He talks about heterophenomenology, well, which means... At the very least, he says that phenomenological reports cannot be challenged in that you know what you know when, when you see it. You know. He doesn't say that. He says, you're right, no description of personal experience can be challenged because any description is as good as any other. Yeah. Okay? That's exactly where people who take phenomenology would differ. They would say, no, it's not the case that any description is as good as any other. There is such thing as better or worse descriptions of experience, right? And what we have tried to provide here is exactly that, a description of experience, right? So this is why phenomenology and Dennett are really uh, at odds with each other, 
because then it thinks that he has a solution to consciousness, which is you guys are just confused. And you think that we have experience, whereas in fact what we have is this non-conscious perceptual processing, and then we have a lot of thinking and idea, and that's what consciousness is, the two put together. And obviously the, the response is, well, how do you explain pain? How do you explain uh, all the raw sensory experience, which I think, to me, doesn't make sense to explain that there's just thinking, there are experiences, and I think we can describe these experiences, and we can do what phenomenologists have done. How do you explain the consciousness the, the, of that? that? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Always distinguish, explain from describe. describe. Yes, describe. always make this distinction. Here we have never tried to explain consciousness. All what we have said is that we can provide relatively accurate description of consciousness, okay? That's a claim here. Now, you can dispute it, and then it would dispute it, but that's a claim which is being made here. Do we need a fresh board for action? Uh, this might be enough, but okay, action. Do you want to write the name Libet in? Libet? Yeah. L I B, I think it's B E T T, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, action, right? Now you say, why talk about action? Well, if you're Buddhist, action that's supposed to be really important, right? And there is a really interesting connection between consciousness and actions. Agency, turns out, is also the case in cognitive science, right? So this is what we need to try to think about. What are actions? And uh, what do we make about, how do we understand actions? And the, the, the way in which they are connected to consciousness. And so we come to Libet, who made uh, a very interesting experiment. OK, so <laughs> you, you have a switch, and you're taught to turn off and on the switch at some point. In front of you is a screen in which there is uh, a, a time measurement, and you're told to observe on the screen the time when you decided to turn on the switch. Okay? And then you have EEGs, you have electrodes on the brain which measures the when the message goes out to your arms to turn the switch, right? So you're told, wait a while, then decide to turn the switch, and when you decide to turn the switch, look at the time. So. That's the switch. This is the time. Yeah. So you can hit the switch at any point you like, but when you do hit that switch, you have to take a note what time was it when you decided to hit the switch. Okay. So this is a, one of the most famous experiment in cognitive science. What do they find? Is that there is a significant time gap between when you Notice your intention to turn on the switch and the message, the efferent message which is going out of the brain to your finger. Which one do you think is first? The question is, do you decide to move first or does your hand move first? Exactly. Yes, 
I know that you can't decide to play notes on a piano fluently, so I'm guessing it's the surprising one. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, all right. Anybody else take another guess? The surprising one. Yes, I know, I know where you're going. I, I know that tennis players start moving the racket when even before they decide, so it's kind of automatically trained to see the ball coming. Yeah, but there they don't decide to hit, right? Sorry. Yeah, but you're all on the right way. The message goes way before you notice your intention way before. There is a, a fairly significant gap between the two. Just to clarify, this means you can measure in the brain and show that the brain has already decided, yes. has even started the well, in many cases, before you actually, the time when you actually note that you decided to press the button. Everything had already started before that. So what do we make of that? Right? This is where we get the idea of it, the kind of passenger going off the right. Yeah, yeah. What you say? I guess you, you mean, uh, by passenger, you mean that actually we don't act, we just think that we act, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is obviously, as you can see, it's going in the Denetian direction, right? The question, yes? Well, I was going to say, though, doesn't it beg the question if a fly lands on my nose and I brush my nose, I'm never going to consciously think there is a fly on my nose. I'm going to brush it off now. Now I will move my hand. Those thoughts never come into my mind at all. I just brush the fly off without any of those thoughts. Yes, but the difference is here. You're instructed to make, because you're, you're not turning all the time, yeah? You're told, wait, and that at some point you decide when you turn on the switch, right? So there is a decision, and then when you make that decision, you're supposed to look at the watch and report when this decision was made. Yeah, I know that, but what I mean is it's an artificial kind of situation. Okay. We don't normally act in that way. Yeah, but... Why did I make the decision to brush the fly off my nose? Okay, but here's the question. Don't we make decisions and act upon these decisions? Is, is there a difference between making the decision and internal reporting of the decision? Well, the, that's an interesting question. The response to that is that the gap is larger than the gap that is needed to make an observation about the decision. Because there is the decision and then there is a noticing of the decision, right? But that takes shorter time than the gap between the efferent uh, message and the time noticed uh, on the clock. Can they measure that difference? Yes, yes. It's in the order of about 100, 150 milliseconds. That's what we are talking about. This has been, Libetian experiment has been reproduced many, many times. The question is what does it mean, right? What does it mean particularly in relation to the action that we think we are taking consciously, that's the decision we are making, right? Because your example of swatting the, the fly is fine, but the, the question is, are, aren't some of our actions different from that kind of action, right? So I decide to make a cup of tea, but actually I'm already got up and I'm halfway to the kettle by the time I think, I know I'll make a cup of tea. Yes. I, I would say swatting the fly is more like you're avoiding that. Yeah. Uh, well, not quite, right? Uh, I will argue that what we need to do is think of actions 
is happening on a continuum from the reflex. Now, what you're doing is not quite a reflex. Reflex is when the doctor hits your knee and you're, uh, oh, you know, you, the ball is coming at you and you duck, right? That's reflex. And fully deliberative, deliberative action. Now, <laughs> swatting the fly would be somewhere around here, right? <laughs> would you agree? Yeah. yeah. Voting for Donald Trump would be. <laughs> uh, it's it's unfortunate. It's yes, yes. We're not talking about intelligence, right? We're just talking about decisions here. So, so this is the question. This is, I think, where philosophy is interesting. Is what do we make of this? Libetian experiment, right? Because it looks like one way to interpret this is like your passenger, right? The brain decides everything, and then we kind of rationalize, right? Yeah, that's a kind of Denetian view. <laughs> there is another view, there are several other views. One of the way to answer to Libet is maybe to distinguish between urge and decision. That is, I think, from a Buddhist perspective, it's pretty reasonable to argue that most of our desires are not conscious, right? That when I am going towards the kitchen to have a cup of tea, it's like I'm following a desire which is maybe here, but most of the time not fully conscious, right? I think that makes a certain amount of sense, right? When I used to smoke cigarettes, I would have reached for a cigarette yes. one before I had any idea. Exactly. But then you make the distinction between urge and decision, right? So what the Libet, what in the Libetian experiment, the, uh, the efferent message, right? Going out of your brain to your body to grab, to push the button, that would be measuring actually not the decision, but the urge, right? The desire. That's one way, I think, to answer. So that would say that the, des the desire comes first and then the urge happens. Well, no, the desire comes first and then the decision. OK. Where does the urge come from? Desire and urge, I think, are more or less the same, no? OK. Well, it depends on your model. Yeah, OK, or maybe the desire comes first and the urge, and then the decision to actually go to the kitchen and get a cup of tea, right? So that would be one way to say no, because it would be one way to answer. And actually, uh, Libet's own theory is not exactly the same, but is along those lines. For Libet, uh, the decision, what he thinks what happens first is the urge, the desire. And then the decision is the decision not to veto the desire. That's called free want. What? That's called free want. Free want. Free want. Yeah. As opposed to free will. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's like you, the, 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 the want, the desire is not free, right? But what you are free is to veto or not veto the desire, right? So Libet's own interpretation of 
the experiment is more or less along this line of thinking that uh, what is actually measured uh, is not the decision, but is actually the urge and the action pushed by this urge. And then the decision is simply the reflection of the uh, acceptance of what is actually pre-conscious, right? Yeah? So, because, perhaps because you have contradictory desires, yes. the, some of the planning for the desire as carried out is carried out before the executive decision to actually take the action. The planning? Yeah, in other words, before you actually decided to go get the tea, you can be thinking about getting up and walking over there. And I mean, you can be thinking out the ramifications of your desire before you actually make the actual decision. Okay. Can we do that? Can we? Thank can, you. Can we say planning comes in here? As well, actually, desire? actually, this is another way to answer Libet is that in the Libetian situation, there is a conscious planning which comes before, right? Conscious or unconscious? No, no, conscious, because you're told your task here is to push the button, to decide to push the button and observe when you do it. And then you form the intention to do it, right? That's conscious, right? So in this case here, you have, thank you, the desire, the planning of the intention, and then you have the desire, and then you have the decision to act, right? So that's showing that actually Libet's experiment is open to multiple interpretations. So these two interpretations, which I gave, differs from your Denetian passenger interpretation. And this is the Wengner, I don't know if it's online. If maybe not, I will send it to you so you can put it. There is an article, pretty bad article by Wengner, which takes this kind of passenger uh, view, which says, no, what this shows is that all our actions are simply automatic and that we rationalize about them uh, but that actually all the work is done uh, at the neuronal level, right? For me, the problem of this view is that in a way it's a kind of strange dualistic view between the neuronal level and your thinking. Because in my way of thinking, every, everything that happens in your consciousness has presumably a neuronal instantiation, right? So for me, you, 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 you cannot kind of separate the two. The, what happened in your consciousness and the neuronal configuration, whatever it is, are simply two aspects of the same phenomenon, right? And so that's why I don't believe the, the Netian view, what you call the passenger view, I think we need to... For people that, because you use the word Denetian, he's yes. referring to the ideas and philosophy of someone called Dennett. Daniel Dennett, which is the person that you were channeling, right? <laughs> 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 no, actually, uh, he, he is in the book, uh, in the phenomenological mind, he's constantly referred to because he's one of the main thinkers in the philosophy of mind, and he's a person who, uh, who is attacking uh, phenomenology because he thinks that the way to go is pretty much this kind of passenger interpretation of the Libet experiment in the case of action, right? And our, the uh, one, I mean, there are two answers. One is the one that I, which is in a way Libet's own, Oh, no, not this, Libet's own uh, explanation. And then there is the other way to think about it, which is that actually actions happen on a 
scale and that some actions are much closer to reflexes and some actions are much closer here. In this case, it's clear that prior to the, the, the urge of pushing the button, there is a conscious planning, I'm going to do this, right? Yeah? Yeah, and that bothers me about these examples is that there's such a wide spectrum of making decisions. There's a huge gap between you know, lighting up a cigarette and saying, I'm going to leave the United States and move to Thailand. Yes, yes. There is a very wide spectrum of, uh, of action, right? Some actions are closer to reflexes. For example, uh, but they're not reflexes, right? Because I would say reflexes are not actions, right? How do we define actions? From a Buddhist perspective? I, I was going to ask you that question because uh, action, uh, yeah. according to uh, Buddhism, is dhar dharma. Meaning no, no, no. That's what I understand. And from what I understand. No, is, sorry, no. Well, let me no. Just finish. Uh, action, uh, according to. There is a word for uh, act that defines precisely action in Buddhist philosophy. There is a precise word which is chetana, chetana. That's a precise word, that's what you use in pasatai, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly, that's a word, chetana. That's how you define action. The action are the behavior which, is, uh, which entails chetana. Now, obviously, what is chetana is really difficult. But it's really interesting that actually the word intention in Western cognitive science is equally problematic. So in cognitive science, how do we define intent? Action, well, most people would say it's intentional behavior. Question, obviously, what is intention? A flag here, intention here means not intentionality of Husserl, but it's intention in the colloquial sense of the word, right? Yeah, so you remember we, we flagged that difficulty when Husserl talked about intentionality. He's not talking about intention, what I intend to do. He's talking about how we make sense of, our, of the world, right? Intention in the old medieval sense of the, the meaning of the term is the intention of the term. Here we're using about intention in uh, pretty much the colloquial way, which is all correspond pretty closely the uh, Buddhist notion of chetana, right? So are you intending not to kick the pillow? Well, <laughs> that's way. Yeah, that's exactly. You see the um, you see the the interesting questions, right? What are intentions? Now, when you are moving to Thailand from the U.S., I assume it's relatively easy to understand intention, right? Because you form a whole plan and so on. But in your Example of swatting the fly. Do you have an intention or not? Could be, you know, I was thinking. Because, well, because if you're in meditation, you might be sitting there, if it's a mosquito, you might be sitting there thinking, well, if I don't swat it off, the mosquito will bite my nose. But Ajahn Shah taught his students to let the mosquitoes bite you, so because otherwise it will disturb your men, but which will disturb my men. So what I mean is you could be making a conscious... No, no, I, I was going back to your example in but which you... But mosquito intended to bite you. Yeah. Well, that's a different question. <laughs> so what I mean... Is, Actually, they do. So what I mean is in yeah. that case, it's, I'm making... Especially you, but they do. I'm making a conscious decision about... No, but that's not your example. That category. That's not your example. That's not your example. Your example was when you, yes. you did it more or less automatically. Yes. Is this intentional or not? 
I would say no. But, right. But it does it's a, it's, come from an intention at some point in the past where you decided that the thing to do about bugs on yeah. your nose. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, you did. The, yeah. No, but you didn't decide in the past. On the contrary, your teacher told you killing insects is really bad karma. So you don't do, well. don't do right? I think that's an interesting example. The first yes. one I think is a reflex. The other one is uh, no. the free world, the first one. Where you, where no, it's not a reflex. Almost. Um, <laughs> exactly. The other one is where it's, you it's like here, right? But then the other one, where you stick thinking about I shouldn't kill the insect, yeah, that is using your free world. There's yeah, the it's, right. it's around here. This when Libet was doing this experiment. I'm sitting there, I decide to push the button. I have an urge to push the button, I push the button. Next, for instance, I have an urge to push the button, and I think about it, that I, no, I'm not going to push the button. Can Libet show something in my brain that's happening there? I, all what they observe is, in a way, the message going out and in, yeah. right? That's basically the difference is between afferent signals which are coming from the senses, and efferent signals which are going out, right? So, no, the, uh, the level of distinction is still relatively coarse, right? So it's not like you can distinguish every little step uh, in the EEG or in the fMRI. It's the knowledge we have is much coarser, right? Because of this problem we have of access to the brain, right? So all what we observe is what comes in and what goes out. The nature of what goes out, that would be tricky because all what we have is this electric wave, right? So they tell us things, but they tell us so the urge is visible one way or the other, and then no, the decision not to act. Well, uh, an urge would probably register as message going out, right? Not necessarily. That's at least one way to interpret uh, Libet is that what he's measuring is actually this. He's measuring the decision to act. The act. Not the decision, the urge. He's actually seeing the act. What? He's seeing the act. He's... No, 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 no. He's measuring the message that goes from the brain out. Right? That's all what he's measuring. I think you might be mistaken here. It's the person who presses the button that says what time it is. He doesn't measure, the experimenter isn't watching him or measuring him. You measure yourself, yeah. and you hit the button when you think you've decided to act, right? Yeah, and what you observe is that the message, the efferent message, has gone out way before. But to his, to his point, this free won't does seem to be a frontal cortex yeah. phenomenon. So, for example, when you tell a lie, the urge, the natural uh, action is to tell the truth, but you have to stop it in the frontal cortex and change it into a lie. Same for if you have an urge for a cigarette, but the frontal cortex will stop that urge. So the free won't does seem to have a separate measurable uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And people with frontal cortex dementia uh, have problems with this. They can't control their social behavior. If they think of something like, you're an idiot, they'll just say it because they have no control over I quite fancy that myself, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a, a measurable... Yeah, but in this case, there is no... Free won't, there's a measurable... Yeah, frontal. yeah. But in Libet's experiment, all the time, the ECG electrodes are on your brain. So even if you're not pushing the button and looking at the clock, it still is measuring your brain. Yes. So while I'm sitting there, I can think, I can push the button. No, let's wait a while. Does that reflect one way or another in the ECG? Uh, probably it's... I don't know the details, 
but you have to realize that uh, what's going on in the brain constantly is very complicated. And so, for example, you would think, oh, let's think about the difference between thinking about, the, about banana and thinking about eating meat, right? Well, probably you would not see anything particular because it's what's going on in the brain is so complicated that you are not able to trace things in a fine-grained way, right? But this free movement, as, as Tom at all explained, is quite often seen as a higher level than yes. free not to do something. Yes. So that seems to me to be quite a strong yes. process as well. Yes. So my question is, I simply don't know, does Nibet or anybody else find that when they measure brain activity? Well, in, the, in this experiment, notice that there, it's just measuring trying to measure the time of the decision, right? Yeah. yeah, that's all what is being measured here. OK, yes? So how, how does that affect the person with Tourette's syndrome? Well, the person with Tourette's syndrome, it's probably close to okay. around here, right? There are interesting kind of uh, action. For example, sometime when I drive my car, and usually I turn right to go home in America, and then sometime I have to go straight if I want to go to the college, and sometime I want to go to the college, but actually I turn right because this is what I do all the, most of the time. So where is that? It's, somewhere around here. It's not that I'm unconscious, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that I'm really fully conscious either, because if I were fully conscious, I would go straight, right? You're probably busy thinking about consciousness. Uh, pro that could, that's one explanation, for example. That's a fairly good one, yes. <laughs> So you can see that the problem of free will is complicated. But in a way, if you think phenomenologically, it's not that complicated because you have to understand the degree to which the action that you make is intentional, right? And that's where free will would come in. Right? The reflex, there is no intention, right? Sorry. You you... Know, I just had a question uh, about the, the word action and uh, Sitona. Is that Sitona? Chetana. Chetana. Okay. Chetana uh, means intention. Yeah, so, you know, uh, in Buddhism, from what I understand, mm -hmm. what Buddha taught that. Uh, um, Consciousness, uh, action was uh, also without uh, manifestation. It was thinking itself. It didn't have to uh, mm -hmm. manifest itself in, in some physical action. So I'm yes. Wondering, is, is that part of your definition of action, or is it different? Yes. One of the interesting questions is whether chetana needs to be conceptual or discursive, right? What is chetana? For example, do animals have chetana? Right? The answer from the Buddhist perspective is clearly yes, and I think it's clearly borne out with, by cognitive science, which is that uh, animals have intention but what they don't have is this kind of discursive intention that we have. So there is, in a way, two levels of intentions so here. the mosquito did intend to bite his nose. Absolutely. Okay. Because, well, absolutely. It's pretty hard to think about consciousness of the mosquito. It's actually really interesting, and people are trying to model the consciousness of really simple animals because with mosquito or bees, you're talking about a relatively simple brain, right? And they are trying to understand what's happening in the brain of bees and so on. But 
I think what we may want to do is to distinguish discursive intention from non-discursive intention, right? So reflex, clearly there is no intention, right? It's just a mechanical operation. And then as we move away from reflexes, probably we need to start to introduce intention, probably at first at the lower level, and then the more the action is deliberative, the more we have discursive intentions, right? So when the Buddhists say actions in chetana, uh, often some Buddhists think, oh yeah, action is about motivation, so I can do whatever I want to do if I have the proper motivation, right? No, this is not what chetana is. In the action of killing, even if your motivation is excellent, the intention in action is going to be negative. This is the Buddhist view. And that Buddhist view actually works pretty well with cognitive science because uh, people in your book actually make this distinction. I don't know if they call it discursive versus non-discursive intention, but Intention is not just motivation, but it is the uh, intention, the direction to act that is happening also while you are acting, right? And from a Buddhist perspective, that intention in the case of killing is always negative, at least as far as what I call intention in action. Your motivation may be good. You may want to shorten the suffering of an animal, but the Buddhist view is that in the killing itself, there is a negative chetana, right? That's a standard Buddhist view. So as we realize, the notion of intention actually is quite interesting and complex because it looks like intention are not just what I think kind of discursively, but it's also something that happens probably at the pre-reflective level as well. That's why we, it's probably relatively safe to assume that animals have intention. Now mosquitoes, probably they do too, but hard to know, but certain mammals and uh, birds have intentions. And it's clear they follow strategy, right? So they, they clearly have goals in mind, not just pursuing goal in a kind of mechanic way, but pursuing go goals in uh, strategic ways. There is a great experiment uh, in which uh, you have a, a, a treat which is enclosed into a mechanism. And to get to the treat, uh, you have a stick and you just need to push uh, the mechanism and the treat will come uh, out immediately. And so what you, you have is on one hand a chimp and on another hand a kid, about five to six years old, already fairly old. And the, the person who is leading the experiment uh, make all kind of bogus movements to get to the tree, like hitting the, the stick several times, left, right, and doing various irrelevant movement, and finally does a movement which gets a tree. And then separately, the chimp and the kid are told, okay, get to the tree. Who do you think gets to the tree more quickly? The chimp. Absolutely. The chimp immediately goes for the treat, no problem, whereas the kid repeats exactly what the adult did and does all this irrelevant movement to finally get to the treat. Now, this shows two things. The experiment is designed to show the degree to which human behavior is socially conditioned, right? That's one clear result, but indirectly, to me and to people who do animal cognition, what this su suggests is that actually the chimp totally understands the situation and just go for the tree and just doesn't take 
look at the bullshit of the human <laughs> and just straight go for the tree. So there is his action uh, are clearly purposive and he's clearly following a, a strategy. So very clear, he has the intention to get to the tree. There is, for me, there is no discussion. Yes. Isn't there an idea that um, because of the amount of uh, stuff we have to learn as human beings, that we just take it in and retain it rather than processing it into course and, uh, course and event, whereas chimps don't do this? And that well, and, and, and the yeah, that's the social learning, right? But we can do it, it's just we have so much we have to assimilate as a human being. Y yes. Just soak it up and then we uh, that's. I mean, there is a f discussion about exactly whether the kid understand what he should do or not. Uh, I think the simplest explanation is that the kid is just imitating the adult, right? Why? Because he, he knows that that's how he's going to learn, right? He's heavily genetically programmed to imitate that, right? Yes, he's certainly... Uh, that's how human we become, we grow up, right? By being socialized. Oh, yeah. No, I, I would not go. You know, mirror neurons is this great discovery. And now everybody is like, what are mirror neurons about, right? This is, there are hundreds of articles which are trying to figure out what mirror neurons are. Mirror neurons is this interesting discovery. Uh, that happened accidentally uh, when they were, measured, they were doing experiment with, I think, chimps, right? I'm not sure. Monkeys or chimps? Yeah, it was chimps. Yeah. And uh, it, they were doing another experiment. And then in the, in the, in the, the pause, they noticed that when they were doing some, when the, the experimenter were doing some action, some of the neurons of the chimps were firing up. And that's where they started to investigate and, and then come up with these mirror neurons. What that means is not sure, right? Yeah. It has to do with understanding the action, right? I think so, at least. But that's really uh, up for ground. So the short end of the story is, do we have free will? Well, the answer, it depends. <laughs> depends what you mean by free will, and it depends on the action you're talking about, right? If we're talking about a reflex, no. The more we are moving towards deliberate action, the more we, are, we can talk about free will. But when we talk about free will from a Buddhist perspective, we are always compatibilist, meaning we are not talking about an action which is uncaused. We're just talking about actions which we have uh, some intention behind, right? That's what free will is from a Buddhist perspective. Often in uh, Western discussion, there is all kinds of theories about free will, and some people think about free will as being the kind of action which are not caused. From a Buddhist perspective, that's absurd. Uh, in fact, I could never, I, I, I tried to explain free will to some of my teachers, and they always came with the reflection, this is ridiculous. Obviously, all actions are caused. So free will is not about whether an action is caused or not caused, but it is a kind of causation that intervene in creating the action. The action here are caused, but they are not example of free will. And what we need to have free will is intention, right? And obviously, you can see that this is not uh, always clear whether we have intention or not because they're all kind of intermediary cases, right? My example of turning to, not turning to the right, did I have intention or not? Uh, when people have psychological problem, they, 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 okay, all kind of problem. So the answer is as often it depends. We talk about the self. Well, no, I was going to ask you a little earlier, you said that Jade and I will have a 
uh, you know, a, a, is good or bad in the action, in, yeah. irrespective of your planning. So I, I want to ask here, are we going to introduce a karmic scale for actions with, with intention? Probably, right? Okay, yeah. Well, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah. Where's yeah. karma coming in here? Well, Chaitanya. Uh, in uh, I, I don't know in Theravada, but in uh, in Yogacara Bhidharma, karma is just defined by chetana, the chetana of the action, right? So uh, yes, there is a kind of karmic scale from. I put a scale on here. Yeah, there is a dark and the light, but there is also the. Yeah, for example. Uh, well, if you think karma is chetana, for example, if you step by accident on some uh, ants, right? Presumably, that's not a form of chetana, right? I was thinking that earlier. So that, that would actually be off the scale there. Actions without... We, well, it would be a reflex, right? It would be like a reflex, yeah. Well, even a reflex has some kind of... Yes, agency, yes, but yeah. Stepping on an ant is an action, but there was no... Jaden, uh, That's right. So it would be on the, the other hand, it would be off the scale. Yeah. On the other hand, if you were stepping on an ant and you were like, oh, you notice the ant even while moving the leg, probably then Chetana comes in, right? So, yes, there is a whole scale of karma, right? You could have stayed in bed. What? <laughs> and not step on the end. <laughs> He said you could have stayed in bed. No. Uh, actually, in real life, there are, I think, I forget, is it Sikhs or James? James. They carry yes. Room with them to make sure they don't step on anything. Yeah. Sleep with mosquito oh, nets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, yeah, that's a difference with the Buddhist, right? The Jain don't think that karma is created by intention. Yeah. In a real life situation, that you work in a, in your office, and then you have at first you have the intention to talk nicely with your colleague, and then you start to have argument. With with a milli, millisecond that you change from your intention that you will talk nicely, and then you turn to talk badly with your colleague. Mm -hmm. But is that called as intention? Yes. But it's like a millisecond before that you try to be nice. Exactly. Yes, it is. Intention goes all the way from the early motivation to the action itself. But it would be less intentional. Well, yeah, sure. That's, that's uh, Pandit's yeah. dark to light, right? If you do it with a good motivation, but you end up, yeah, insulting the person, with intention, right? Because you might actually say something which you think is good and the person might misunderstand, take it completely differently. And that's a different situation, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about situation in which you, you know, sometimes you want to talk to a person where you have the good intention, then the conversation turns out really nasty, right? Yeah. That's intention, right? That's intention in action as well. So you see what we're trying to do here is trying to think about consciousness and cognitive science in Buddhist terms. And I think actually it works really well. It works for the most part. It works really well because uh, in cognitive science, actions are supposed to be really important because consciousness is for the sake of acting, right? And I think in Buddhism, it's also the case, right? Okay. So, uh, self, right? Yes. <coughs> so, another quite feature of this model is that uh, if you think of this whole thing, consciousness is one, right? Is unified field of 
receptivity in which we sort out all the input that we receive from the external world, right? And so the question, obviously, is, is this a self, right? What is self? This consciousness, this field, unified field of consciousness, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. Is it a self or not? That's one obvious question, right? Because it's not just unified, but it also has a sense of what I've called I-ness, right? What? I-ness. It's happening to me, for me, for I. So this is a Buddhist perspective. No, no, this is just asking the question. OK? This is just asking the question. OK? In, in philosophy, often the question is more important than the answer, right? So what is important is for you to understand what motivates the discussion about the self, right? And what motivates is the idea that this consciousness is this sense of uh, entails self-awareness, this sense of I-ness, that its experience is happening for me, for I. And it's this kind of unified field from a subjective, unified from a subjective perspective. Obviously, we're not talking about how things really are. We are just talking about how they appear to us in our experience, right? We're doing phenomenology, right? So the question is, does this imply that there is a self or not? OK? Now, phenomenologists, as I said in an earlier class, are divided on that uh, question, who sold? Uh, posited uh, what they call a transcendental ego. Other phenomenologists, like Sartre in his earlier period, and Merleau-Ponty, and Heidegger, to, yeah, Heidegger too, thought much more in terms of, no, there is no self. There is just subjectivity. Descartes. No, Descartes, there is a self. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. That's a contact between consciousness and the body, which is in your pineal gland. It's not uh, the self, right? Uh, in fact, uh, one of uh, uh, Husserl's uh, text is called Cartesian Meditation. So uh, Husserl is very much in this school of Western philosophy that posits that there is a self. Uh, if you l look at a text like The Transcendence of Ego by Sartre or Merleau-Ponty, you will see thinkers who think there is no self, right? OK, so what's the Buddhist position? Well, I don't think there is the Buddhist position, but I think it might be helpful to think about the self in Buddhism from a phenomenological perspective. Now, in Buddhism, there is a lot of discussion about the self from a metaphysical perspective. Does the self exist, yes or no? And there are discussions about that. Well, does the Atman exist? The, the self. There is no, the, the Atman is just a word for self. So I'm not denying that in Buddhism there are plenty of discussion uh, in the Buddhist tradition about whether the self exists from a metaphysical perspective. How are things in reality? What I want to sketch out here is a way to answer that question from a phenomenological perspective, not how are things in reality, but how do we experience ourselves 
and what are these different senses of self that we have, and can we, to a certain degree, talk about whether they are distorted or not? And this is where I introduce a threefold typology of self. Yeah. Minimal self, core self, extended self. There, there is a lengthy video on YouTube of George talking about this in-depth covering of these different selves. OK, so what I'm talking about, well, I think there is a sense of self, which I call the minimal self, which is just the fact that I have the sense that experience is ha happening to me. That's what I call the minimal self. So that's a self which implies that I have a perspective from which I am experiencing the world. And understanding, maybe not in a discursive way, but understanding that things are happening to me, like the example of the chimp who is looking for the treat, the chimp has a sense that he is this being who is experiencing and acting. He's probably not able to think of this in a discursive way, but it's, that's certainly, that's not certainly, sorry, most likely is his experience, right? So that's what I call the minimal self. And that self, I would argue, is not really, implies some degree of distortion. But it's not the self that Buddhists are talking when they are talking about no self. The self, minimal self, is just the fact that I have subjective experience, that I am the subject of my experience. That self exists only in the moment, right? Next moment, I have a different experience. It's a different configuration, yet I have this sense that things are happening to me, right? Right, and, and over that 10 seconds with the ape is planning to get the Banana. Yes. Yeah. The same person in that 10 seconds. Well, uh, we, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, yeah. We can say it's not 10 seconds, it's much smaller, actually. But yeah. So, in the moment of experience, and we might have trouble individuating moments of experience, right? Uh, there is a sense of self, and I think that sense of self is, in a way, intrinsic to having subjective experience. And then you're going to ask the question, well, what about the fully enlightened being? Does he have that sense of self or not? And actually, there are contradictory answers in the Buddhist tradition. So that's, OK. That's an interesting question. It's obviously highly speculative. And uh, I'm just throwing at you to show you the degree to which this kind of cognitive science discussion have interesting uh, repercussion uh, for Buddhists, because it raises interesting questions. And actually, if you look at the way Buddhahood, uh, the, the experience of a Buddha is explained in various sources, you will see completely contradictory answers. Some answer will present the Buddha as acting without any intention. Uh, some other sources will present him very differently. I would think that as long as you have a subjective experience, you have that minimal self. Some Yogacara talk about uh, the fully enlightened Buddha as having distortion. Distortion. Yes, because he has this minimal self, which implies a distortion in the sense that you see the world from a particular perspective, right? So that's the minimal self, right? 
So you can, you can say, well, yeah, that's a kind of self, but it, it lasts only in the moment of experience. And so uh, it, it's, it's, it's certainly not what the Buddhists talk about when they talk about no self. So core self, right? Well, let's, before we talk about the core self, let's talk about the extended self. The extended self is my sense of self that is developed in, from early infancy in which I see myself not just being in the moment, but being a continuous uh, entity over a long period of time, right? When I was a kid in high school, blah, blah, blah. It's me, and there I have a really extended self, sense of self, right? You say history? Yeah, it's your history, but actually it's... Temporally extended, not physically extended. Yeah, it's temporally extended, right? I was, when I was in college, blah, 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 right? This I is, in a way, the extended self, right? Wouldn't that uh, extended self be more like a baby that's not conscious of separation between itself and its environment? That's much more the minimal self. Yeah. Now, that extended self, I think it's pretty obvious that it's a construction, right? It's a constant recreation that I do when I remember things, right? It's not like the I that was in college is the same I that uh, is ex remembering now. It's just that the I which is remembering now can reconstruct a memory from various elements and put together this experience and create this fictional entity which is me as existing from now and back in time to my birth, right? So it's pretty obvious, to me at least, that that extends itself is a fictional construction, right? So is this a self of no self that the Buddhists are talking about? We don't have too much longer. To yeah, I'm getting... My answer is no. There is a much more basic sense of self that is below that sense of extended self. That's what I call the core self. That core self is based on a division that I made in my field of experience between me and what's not me. Right? In the minimal self, there is no distinction. The only aspect that the minimal self is about is that this is happening to me, right? This is I who is experiencing whatever I am experiencing. There is no self versus other distinction. That distinction, self versus other, happen in early childhood when the child is learning to differentiate what he or she can control from what he or she cannot control, right? And so the child builds this if you want this kind of model in his head or her head about which differentiate what happens to me versus what's not happening to me. What is in, in my control, what's not in my control. That's a core self and that's where I think this is a target of Buddhist practice, the sense that I am in control of my action, right? That I am the one who is doing. That's what I think the self of no self is really located. And that self of no self, that self exists in humans and presumably it exists also in animals, right? 
That's a kind of self that we need that is usually at work when we act, right? So in the case of the chimps, I would think what we are talking about is actually the core self, right? Can I just ask a question here? Yep. When you're saying other, you have two ideas. One is uh, what is me as opposed to what is not me. Yes. But there's another thing, me as opposed to other self. Yes, other person. Well, it's both, right? It's both. Well, there's a difference. Yes, there is a difference, but it's actually both. What, what, is, what is involved in the core self is a differential repartition of cognitive and affective resources, right? That is, what touches me is given a totally different level of importance than what's touching another person, right? And that's... Uh, so that idea of core self is kind of a partition of the field of experience into me versus not me, right? And that, I think, is a self of no self. And that's a self that meditation, I think, is trying to undo. That self is the self involved in a kind of low-level action versus that self, which is involved in much more complicated planning and so on, when you decide to, uh, that self is kind of the self that of identity, right? Who am I? Well, I am that kind of person who has moved to Thailand. Versus that self is who you think you are when you're going to the bathroom. It was an interesting experiment done on this with the, with the worms, the very simple worms. And if you were to touch the worm, it would recoil. Mm -hmm. But if the worm moves itself and touches the same thing, it wouldn't recoil. Because the worm can understand yes. to such a tiny degree that I was the one moving rather than that thing touching, even though the sensation was the same. Mm -hmm. So the supposition yeah. was that the beginning of self, me and other, goes back to a very, very basic level. Yeah, I think that's, I think both scientifically and from a Buddhist perspective, uh, the two, yeah, I think that's, I, yeah. wait, yeah. How about then number one? Because still in the four me-ness, there is a me. No. Me and the other may be, may be one. Okay. But if in Buddhism, wouldn't we say there is no self, there is no uh, see, there is just a seeing. <laughs> this is why I use the word I-ness. Because we need to use word, right? But in the minimal self, there is no sense of a me versus anything else. There is just a sense that I am the one experiencing the, undergoing the experience, right? I am the one, that's it. Well, there is a subjective element in consciousness, but that subjective element does not involve a preferential disposition of cognitive and affective resources. Yeah. But in non-self, there's not a self at all. There is not, I see you, there is just seeing. No. There is a sense that you are the one seeing. Even when you, there is no self, it's still the sense that you're located in a particular place in space and time, and you are undergoing the experience. And that's why some yogacharas say, even the Buddha is going to have some level of distortion, because he's always located in a particular place of time, and that in itself involves already a distortion. But it's not a distortion in which, which is based on the distinction between self and others. It's a distinction which is comes from the, uh, the fact that consciousness is perspectiva, right? It's always located in a particular place and time. Now, some people will say the Buddha transcends that, but at least that's what the Yogacharyan uh, were arguing, I think. Yeah? 
how pundits learn if operationally has a belief in the core cell. What's that? The, the example that yeah. you just gave about the worm. Okay, it behaves operationally as if there is a core cell. Mm -hmm. But say, I'm going to go no. Say it has no discursive belief in its core cell. Then what is the nature of the distortion? What is the what? The nature of the distortion. I mean, the nature of distortion. It doesn't really believe in itself. No. In a sense, it does because it behaves. As yeah. It has itself. It's well, the point of that of, of that set of experiments was that the animal starts to get a sense of consciousness when it acts. So it was it part of. It rises out of it. It was what's, it's what's called enacted consciousness. That consciousness isn't something into which it comes, but consciousness is something that you do. And called enacted consciousness, there are several psychologists and philosophers. Yeah. But it doesn't have a belief of that. No, it doesn't have a belief. It's just born from learning to distinguish what the actions that I that are controlled by the organism for the actions that are not controlled, that are done to the organism. That's a basic distinction that the brain learns how to make, right? And so the core self is born out of this distinction. Born out of it. I yes. Think. Now, uh, OK, that's at least how I would put it. Now I talked with developmental psychologists and some development psychologists say it goes way beyond that. It's already in the womb. Some people say, no, not at all. It's learned in the first few months of life. OK, I don't know. I'm not a development psychologist, and I think the evidence is not sure. But what is clear is that very quickly there is this distinction of that the organism means between what the organism done does and what is done to it, right? Yeah. And so the whole field of experience is in a way partitioned into what's self and what's not self. Now, this is not a belief. This is just a set, if you want to say, of kind of habitual reaction, right? Almost free. Yeah, not quite, but yes. Now I understand the difference between uh, the extended self and the, the, the first two. Yes. But the one in the two, can you help me draw the line? Here? The minimal self. Yes. And the core self. And the core self? Yes. <laughs> the core self implies a sense of controlling, right? implies a sense of controlling. The minimal self does not have, is simply the fact of experiencing. I, I interpret minimal self as mainly temporal. Am I wrong with that? No, you mean, uh, no, you're right. It's the constant resetting of the consciousness to create this sense of this is happening to the organism, right? I, you remember I started the discussion by, on the basis that there is consciousness from a subjective perspective is unified, right? Meaning it's happening to the organism. That's the minimal self. That's what I call the minimal self. It's a sense that I am experiencing. Now, I'm using word, and, but you say, well, I is differentiated from you. I need to use word to talk about something which is actually pre-discursive. Uh, we're just about out of time. As I mentioned, this uh, schema, George, there's a talk on YouTube of George, Easy Go Listeners of Pathological State, I think was the talk's name, title. So he talks about these in quite detail if you want to know more about what he's thinking Make about this. for us couch potatoes. Yeah, but on the website, there's a link to the YouTube channel, okay. and so all the videos are on the channel. Uh, and raising the question of what is a self in cognitive science and in Buddhism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we, there's a whole talk about that on there. Okay, I'm going to thank you, George, for coming.
you think that was difficult? You should see what's coming next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when is next week?